Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Mark Elliott. I'm a professor here at the University of Alabama. Um, I, you've, you've seen a little bit of what the great things around water that are going on at this, this university. I've been here 11 years now, and uh, it's changed quite a bit. We've, um, you know, made a transition to being a real player in, uh, in the water and wastewater research space. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some work that I've been doing starting shortly after I got here. Thanks, Zach. Um, to start to um, characterize the nature and scope of the problems with wastewater management in the Black Belt region of Alabama, and then moving towards a transition to addressing those problems. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I mean, I've, I'm here talking to mostly uh, water and wastewater engineers, so maybe I don't need to, to give this for everyone, but I'm sure there's some people in the room for whom uh, the distinction between where your wastewater goes when you flush uh, is not totally clear. So set about 75% of the population of the U.S. has a sewer connection, or they're you know, often said to be on city sewer. The other 25% are responsible for their own wastewater management. Mostly, that, mostly that's done through conventional septic systems. Okay? Obviously, um, in cities that have a very concentrated population, uh, sewer coverage is almost universal. But when you get out into rural areas, it's a mix. And about si over 60% of the rural population in the United States uh, does not have access to sewer and instead has or is supposed to have an on-site wastewater treatment system. Okay, just to let you know, the main type of system is a conventional septic system. Okay, um, conventional septic systems work by um, gravity moving the, um, the wastewater and that I, by that, I mean everything that goes down a drain in the home from uh, your kitchen sink, your dishwasher, your washing machine, your toilet, your shower, all that wastewater goes into the same place. It flows into a septic tank. The solids settle to the bottom. Fats, oils, and greases float to the top. And then the liquid is moved out to a drain field and it's infiltrated into the ground. All right. So. Um, I don't have my, my pointer, the solids at the bottom of that tank are just what you think they are. Um, the, it doesn't give a lot of detail here, but um, there's typically a filter, there's typically um, a wall a ba that baffles and prevents the solids from moving to the, to the back part of the, of the tank, or most of the solids from moving to the back part of the tank, and then a filter at the back end so it's only the liquids that go out to the drain field. But once they get into the drain field, they percolate down into the ground by gravity. Okay. And I'll, I'm explaining this because it's key to why wastewater management is such a challenge in the Black Belt of Alabama. All right, so <clears throat> the so-called Blackland Prairie soils, which you may have heard of, um, these are shrink swell soils or vertisols that dominate the Black Belt counties, okay? And now we put two soil maps together that we found uh, online. I'm not a soil scientist, I don't try to be. But um, the purple here in Alabama and kind of that crescent that turns into that dark brown into Mississippi are a shrink swell clay, okay? And that's what, what, what I mean by that is that's the dominant soil at the surface at that in those areas. When you actually get down to properties, sometimes you find a great diversity of soils even on, even on a single property. But for this uh, map, it just shows the dominant soil type, okay? In a place where these soil types dominate, uh, these shrink swell clays, um, it's almost impossible to get a conventional septic system to work. It's basically impossible. And this is why, okay? When these soils dry, they shrink and crack, okay? And at that point, water can infiltrate into the very quick, very easily. But when they get wet, they swell up and they seal off. And I like this picture because I think it gives you an intuitive sense for how impermeable um, these soils get when they get wet, okay? And if you think back to the conventional septic system diagram in that drain field, the wastewater percolating into the surface, okay, you can imagine that if you're trying to percolate by gravity water through a surface like this, it's just going to get stuck. So what happens is the um, wastewater backs up into the yard, or even if they backfill, if they backfill with that vertisol, it can even go back and back up into the home, um, which is really a disaster for, uh, for people who are out in rural areas. Um, so there are alternative systems that are more expensive that you can make work in these areas, but this is just to show you a little bit about the demographics uh, in the rural Black Belt of Alabama. Um, average incomes, a lot lower, um, a little over half the U.S. average. It's quite a bit below the, um, the uh, Alabama average. 
the uh, population density is very low, so sewer doesn't make sense in a lot of places. Running sewer uh, is much more efficient, much more cost effective when you have concentrated uh, populations. And we'll talk about the details of those expenses um, in a little while. A large proportion of the population is on federal disability uh, in the Black Belt. You may have heard about that. It's gotten a decent amount of media coverage over the last few years. College graduation rates are low, and the median age is older. So we have an older population. Young people who are upwardly mobile tend to move out of the Black Belt to Birmingham, to Atlanta, to Tuscaloosa, et cetera. So in this area with low income, we have a relatively low tax base. We've got low population density. Um, not a lot of cities and towns are large enough to support centralized sewer. Most counties have either two or three, uh, sometimes one uh, town that has a centralized sewer system. And because of the soils, the, the on-site systems that are most common, that are affordable for most of the people in this area, don't work. Okay? And what does that lead to? It leads to system failures, where systems are backing up into the yard or into the home. Uh, here you can see a puddle of sewage with a dog um, uh, sitting in it in the summer. The dog, indoor outdoor pets, uh, like dogs, they love to cool off if they get the opportunity in the Alabama summer. And even if it means going into a puddle of sewage, they really don't mind, trust me. I mean, you've even, you, they'll even drink it sometimes. Um, you can see that kid's ball has gone into that puddle. Kids just think that's a puddle. It's actually sewage. So there's obviously paths for fecal pathogens to go from the hands of kids on those balls or from the pet inside the home and get into people's mouths and make them sick. A more common alternative in some of the areas where we've worked is actually to say, forget about it. I'm not going to invest in a, a septic system that's going to cost me thousands of dollars uh, and that's going to fail and cause these problems. I'm just going to put a pipe out under the leaves, maybe bury it um, under some, you know, have it be under some kudzu down off the back of my property and discharge through what's called a straight pipe. Okay, and, and I'll talk about some of the data that we have, but that's a relatively common um, quote unquote solution in a lot of uh, the very rural and most um, uh, low income areas. This is a, a less common solution where instead of a pipe, they dug a trench and, and, their, and their wastewater is running through a trench uh, and off the property. Okay, so um, how common is this? Well, there wasn't one, when I got here to Alabama, there had been one survey to quantify the, uh, the scope, uh, how common uh, straight pipes and on-site wastewater failures were. It was done in Bibb County. It was funded by the Alabama Department of Environmental Management. They were supposed to do two counties, but they did one and then they ran out of money. So they did Bibb County, which is not actually a black belt county. It doesn't have those really bad soils. But they found 15% of homes had a straight pipe. Okay, uh, that's 15% of unsewered homes. So not the, not the homes in areas where they had a sewer connection, but the ones outside uh, the sewer without a sewer connection. And generally that's about half of homes in, in the rural black belt, a little bit more probably. But 15% of homes had a straight pipe and about 50% showed evidence of sewage getting to the surface. Now that would include if you've ever seen a septic drain field where the grass is growing very robustly above the drain field or it gets a little bit wet that's also evidence of sewage coming to the surface, okay? Um, these, I found these numbers to be outrageous when I first heard about them coming, you know, I, I was in North Carolina previously. North Carolina does have straight pipes. They do have failing on-site systems. But I thought 15% was really um, kind of unheard of in the United States. I'll continue with some of the work we've done to characterize um, uh, this uh, shortly, but that's what we knew when we started, okay? So we knew... Overall wastewater management in the Black Belt was lacking. There were few municipal sewer systems. Rural residents, many of them, low income, didn't really have viable options for handling their, their wastewater. Uh, we knew that it impacted a large percentage of, of the Black Belt. Um, and uh, the lack of key infrastructure also limits economic development. So um, very, very few businesses are willing to take a chance on an on-site wastewater system in an area that where it might fail because their whole business gets shut down if it does fail, okay? so. You may have noticed if you've driven from, say, Montgomery um, down uh, I-65 to the coast, or you've driven, uh, say, uh, on 2059 across from Mississippi, that you can go past many exits and not even see a fast food restaurant sometimes. Sometimes there'll be like a blimpy or a subway at a gas station. But if there's not centralized sewer at those exits, those businesses don't want to invest. I mean, let, there's no hotels either in most of, the, most of those places. Um, but you can go 
you know, sometimes dozens of miles without finding those, what we would consider basic amenities of a, of a highway exit because of the risk of, of, of in, installing um, an on-site system that might fail. So um, we didn't know about public health impacts. There had been some reports and anecdotal data. Um, environmental impacts and effects of the watersheds on drinking water. So um, we came up with, um, oh, oh, and there was one big question that was, that was out there. If all these um, wastewater fecal pathogens are getting out into the environment and on people's properties, shouldn't we be seeing evidence of health impacts? But it's difficult in this region because there's pretty poor, it's, it's, there's poor access to primary care uh, physicians, okay? Most, um, most of these Black Belt counties have one or two primary care physicians, like family doctors. Um, some have gone through periods of having zero, not a single doctor in the whole county. Um, and there's, even if someone does go to the doctor because of gastrointestinal illness, there's not a lot of um, incentive in the system to actually try to characterize the specific pathogen that they're infected with, report it to the, uh, through the health department, to the CDC. It's mostly just, hey, let's try to get you through this diarrhea and get you back uh, on track. You know, if someone's really like at death's door, they might do a, more, a, deep, a deeper investigation, might send them to UAB. But for the most part, there's not widespread surveying of why, of why people are getting sick and, and what's causing um, the illness. So there was a, sewage, there was a, um, a survey in the early 90s of sewage-associated helminth infections. Um, helminths are intestinal worms, uh, flatworms, roundworms. Um, Amy Badham, who's now um, uh, Amy Chatham, she's at uh, UAB, and she had done this study as part of her MPH. She's now on the faculty there. And she found that one-third of kids under 10 in her, stu in her study tested positive for intestinal worms. Okay, that was in the early 90s, and it wasn't a representative sample. It was kids who had been basically targeted for a, a support program. So it was a, it was a selected sample uh, that probably would have high, be expected to have higher rates of these infections. There were, there were data published in 2017 that made a big splash that hookworm was, was detected in, um, in Lowndes County by a team uh, at Baylor Medical uh, School. However, there's been follow-ups from other teams over the last six to eight years, and they just published their finding that they found no evidence of hookworm or other intestinal infections in the, um, in the samples that they took uh, throughout the black belt. Uh, that was mostly in kids, and, um, it was a, but it was a large representative sample across, uh, across multiple counties. So that was kind of reassuring, I think, um, to some extent, but that's a late breaking that's, that just came out in uh, December. Okay, so how would we go about characterizing this problem? We had some different, me we had some different methods that we were uh, using. Um, first of all, Site-by-site -site inspections and surveys in the Black Belt. This is not something that you can send students out to do and go poke around people's backyards out in rural areas. Um, it's not safe. Um, so we had to hire locals uh, to do this work. But um, in Wilcox County, we tried to get a representative sample of about a tenth of the um, unsewered homes. Uh, we got 104 houses, like stick-built homes or homes on slab, and 185 mobile homes that were representative, broadly representative of the de county demographics and the soil conditions, only um, under less than 7% of the homes had a, had a permitted on-site system. So that doesn't mean they didn't have a system, but Alabama has a certification program for on-site wastewater system installers. And they're, they use rigorous methods, they go through the health department. There are people who do under the table septic system installation, uh, they're less expensive, often, um, often not as good. People do get scammed as well. Um, but so we had 270 homes, about 93, 94% that did not have a, a permit, okay? 60% of, of, of our homes, of our sample, a straight pipe was visible upon inspection, which is really bad, way worse than uh, we had seen in Bibb County. Um, it's also worse than the other counties um, that have been surveyed. Hale County also, um, not nearly this... Uh, not nearly this bad. Wilcox County is right next to Lowndes County. It has almost identical soil and very um, analogous um, sociodemographic uh, conditions. 34% of homes were unpermitted but did not have obviously have a straight pipe, so they either had one of these under the table septic systems or they had a straight pipe that was well buried and hidden, okay? I know, for example, right along the Alabama River, there's some plots that are so small, they're not making a drain field work on that plot with the water table right at the surface, so I think they're probably running the pipe into the, into the river. Um, yeah, just 
keep it in mind. It's not legal, but it's probably common. You know, if you're thinking about some uh, like recreational activity or something. Um, also, data from local stakeholders. So we had, if you go out into a rural community, they mostly know, right? But they don't publicize the information because it's technically illegal and people don't want to others to know that they have a straight pipe. But we did ask some installers who had worked in areas uh, for many years about the rates of straight pipe use. And they said it would be lower than our, our Wilcox County averages, but, but higher than our Bibb County averages. So maybe say 20, 30, 40% of homes in a low income rural community would probably have a straight pipe. And, and for straight pipes, I'm, I'm considering both a septic tank, but no drain field, or just a pipe that goes straight out and all the toilet paper and everything goes on, under the ground as a straight pipe, okay? Because when we're talking about pathogens, the vast majority of the pathogens are getting out uh, either way. Okay, we also tried some flow routing in GIS to figure out where, if there were straight pipes, where, they, where the flow would be going on the surface, and then sampling both up gradient and down gradient of those to try to capture um, the contamination. So uh, this is just a, an illustrative um, figure where you say, okay, we know there are homes in this area. If there was a straight pipe from this home, where would it, where would that wastewater go when it rained and it ran off by gravity? And then you can figure out the accumulation of the flow at that point and find places where you can sample. If it's a more robust creek or river, um, you, can you can definitely sample up gradient as much as you want. You may have tributaries you can sample on and then sampling you know, adjacent and then down gradient um, to try to capture the contamination. So here's an example of where we've done that. This is um, New Bern, Alabama, which we'll talk about again later when we, when we get to solutions. But uh, this is about an hour south of, um, of Tuscaloosa. You can see um, the red dot there on the map of Alabama. This is a town of about 100, roughly 100 homes. Um, we did some flow routing uh, uh, on this town to figure out where, if these homes that are east of um, Highway 61, where that wastewater would flow if they had a straight pipe that was discharging onto the surface, and then identified points where we could access Big Prairie Creek and sample both up gradient and down gradient to try to quantify the effect that those straight pipes had on, um, on water quality. And just very, very briefly, just a quick snapshot of our early data on E. coli. Um, so there was a long drought in the fall of 2016. You may remember if you were here, it didn't rain for over 70 days. And what we found was no difference in water quality uh, E. coli concentrations on Big Prairie Creek during that drought. Okay, so when there's no rain falling onto the surface and flushing things into the, the creek, there was no significant difference in the concentration of E. coli. But after the drought broke, we saw some increase up, up gradient of, uh, of New Bern, um, an increase adjacent. Now, this is, this is a log scale. So this is a, every one unit is a 10x increase, okay? An in, so about a 10x increase up gradient, about 100x increase uh, adjacent to New Bern and about 1,000x increase in the E. coli concentration down gradient. We have extensive pathogen sampling going on now, so we'll have more data that's coming out shortly, but um, that's just some preliminary data that we had that indicated that the straight pipes were causing adverse effects on the water quality. Okay, so we focused early on in characterizing the nature and scope of the problem. Now we're moving towards addressing the problem, okay? So that includes categorizing and defining the various barriers to wastewater solutions. Um, convening partners and leveraging resources to implement solutions, and developing solutions that are appropriate to the community, and then implementing those, finding funding uh, to get them implemented. So in terms of the technical solutions, we identified three main typologies. Um, one, go to the areas where they do have sewer and see if it makes sense to expand the sewer to capture communities that are uh, adjacent. Two, identifying cost-effective and appropriate individual on-site wastewater treatment systems, or OWTS. I'll use that. That, um, that acronym OWTS uh, later on in the, in the, in the presentation. So um, just so you understand, uh, what the, I want to just make sure you understand what that means. And then establishing decentralized, decentralized clustered systems where you network a smaller number of homes together, not a full size sewer, and it's not conventional gravity sewer, and I'll describe those technologies. But those are the three main technical typologies by which we believe the problem can be addressed. It's been called a three-legged stool, okay? And then in addition to these, um, identifying and evaluating 
management structures for decentralized wastewater treatment, okay? So not just putting in systems, but figuring out how these systems are gonna be managed, which is a challenge um, to operate and manage these systems in an affordable, sustainable way. And then exploring regulatory changes, some of which have been uh, implemented already, and potentially special permitting districts, uh, one of which has been implemented, um, through our consortium for Al uh, Alabama Rural Wastewater and Wastewater Management, okay, which we established in 2018, and I'll talk about that, that and our partners um, shortly. Okay, and hopefully we, we hope that leads to installation, not just of solutions, but solutions that are sustainable. That means financially sustainable, acceptable to the community, et cetera. Okay, so in terms of the three system typologies, the three big picture ways that we can uh, address uh, wastewater uh, collection and treatment, um, expansion of, exist, uh, of and connection to existing sewers. So, so there will be, most sewers just run right up to the city limit and stop. If they put a school outside the city limit, they'll run it to the school. If there's a jail, they'll run it to the jail, you know. But mostly the, the sewers run right up to the city limits and, and that's, if you're outside it, you're out of luck. There are, some, there are a few exceptions for developments where they get a deal, make a deal with the developer and the developer pays the, the, the city to, to connect. But um, that is uh, not what happens with drinking water. With drinking water, these systems you know, spider web all throughout these counties. You may have noticed if you're driving in rural Alabama that you see fire hydrants and you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's because they ran the water miles and miles to get it to um, some homes. Okay, so uh, yeah, connection fees are very expensive. That often is because utility bylaws, if you expand sewer, the bylaws say you can't raise the rates of the existing customers to serve new customers, okay? And that varies, but that's one reason why it can be very, very expensive to expand sewer. However, running sewer is a massive operation. It's super disruptive and expensive and time consuming, okay? So here's just a typical uh, sewer main installation, just images that I found uh, online. You can imagine if you've got a town that's got one main highway through it and then you shut it down for who knows how long, that it's a big, um, uh, that it's a big uh, inconvenience to people. Also, um, running sewer is very expensive. These are um, 2019 estimates for cost. These, uh, like a lot of things, these rates have gone up quite a bit, even much more than consumer products, I would say, in terms of the rates. But per foot of sewer line, it's about $250 was the, was, was the high end of the estimate. I've heard lately that um, estimates are coming in about $4 million a mile. Now, I've even heard some estimates coming in in Florida at $8 million a mile to run a conventional gravity sewer. And I'll talk about why conventional gravity sewer is so expensive and why there are alternatives that, maybe, that are less expensive. Okay. So sewer line per foot, um, if you add that up, it's over a million dollars a mile, okay? And it can be a good bit higher, uh, a, a good bit more than that um, in, in 2023. In addition to that, there are costs per homeowner as well, okay? So this is just to run the sewer main. So you can imagine if you've got, you know, 20 homes that are, um, you know, two miles outside of town, it's gonna it's say it's gonna cost you $2 million uh, to run uh, your sewer main. That's $100,000 a home just to run the sewer main out there. Um, there's also costs associated with the connection, okay, of the home to the sewer once you get there. So here's an example of a county just to illustrate why it's so hard to network um, these homes together by sewer. This is Wilcox County. They actually have three uh, public sewer systems, Camden, Pine Hill, and Oak Hill as a tiny little system. Um, but this is pretty typical of a black belt, of a rural black belt county, okay? So if you, when you get these homes that are so spread out, you've got maybe 50% of the population in these three locations. The rest of the population, you're gonna need to find a different solution. You're not gonna run sewer main all throughout um, a county like Wilcox County. Okay, so the default solution is single home on-site systems, okay? So we do have, um, there is some funding that's been delivered through, uh, uh, through the health department um, to one of our partners that I'll talk about to install on-site systems. Um, there is an opportunity also to do more comprehensive soil surveys where you, where you find on a piece of property that there may be a place where you actually can make a conventional septic system work. You find that, you know, some um, small but, but non-negligible proportion of the time, okay? And then uh, we also have a new state regulation that was put into place uh, almost two years ago now that in areas where they have the worst soil, where the perk rate is over 240 minutes per inch, which is um, the worst, it's the categorization of the worst 
uh, quality, so the worst soil for, uh, for infiltrating uh, wastewater. Um, there's a new state reg that allows treatment, disinfection, and surface discharge in those areas under limited conditions. And there have been some systems that have been installed um, under this new reg. So a conventional system looks like this, either with, uh, with gravel in the uh, filling and drain field or with these um, plastic chamber systems, which are kind of like a plastic hemisphere that supports the soil above and allows the wastewater to come in and have a place to infiltrate. The most common uh, alternative system in these areas would be a, a mound system, where you bring in a, a, a separate soil or a sand and fit that, that you can build up and actually pump the wastewater up to, typically pump the wastewater up to that mound and have it infiltrate into that better soil. However, those generally do fail over time. They're more expensive, unaffordable to many of, uh, of the residents. And also, people don't love having something like that in their backyard. You know, I wouldn't like it in my backyard either. Um, there are other units. Uh, aerobic treatment units are very common in Mississippi. Um, they probably will become more common uh, in Alabama now with this new regulation that allows some limited surface discharge. Um, drip distribution uh, systems, even more expensive, much more expensive uh, than mounds. And then other sand filters and recirculating sand filters, things like that, that have been made to work in some locations. Typically, uh, in Alabama, um, in the Black Belt, these have been used more for commercial applications than for individual homes. Okay, so the third category is the, are these clustered decentralized systems, okay? Um, the components of clustered decentralized systems, uh, like remote monitoring, um, memory-based technologies, uh, uh, sensors, they're all declining in price, while a lot of the like infrastructure installation expenses are increasing. So there's the potential to make these, um, to make these systems work uh, and be sustainable over time, okay? Um, there's also the advantage of, of economies of scale. So when you put in one of these systems, it can be very expensive, but as you build more, it can be, the, the cost per system declines a lot, especially because of the operator, the role of the operator, um, and the fact that operators can go to multiple systems and, and, um, and run those and get push notifications on their phone if, say, the conductivity is out of whack or the pressure changes unexpectedly, and actually do some simple management on a, on a phone or a tablet. Okay, so liquid-only sewers are the main technology that we've been looking at for uh, these cluster decentralized systems, okay? Um, these are, um, in contrast to gravity sewer, where all the solids and everything goes into the gravity sewer and has to be conveyed, um, liquid-only sewer each home has a septic tank that collects the solids and only the liquids are conveyed, all right? Um, in gravity sewer, because of the, the scour, what's called the scour velocity, you've got to maintain either steep slopes or have pump stations to keep the velocity high. When you're only moving the liquids, you don't need those things. So you can do much, much smaller diameters. You don't have to worry about the slope. If, if, the, if the wastewater comes to a stop, it's fine, you can keep it, um, it, it, can, it, it will move again, and it can be pumped a number of miles, usually up to about five miles on flat ground, with just a simple pump that's inside the septic tank itself, okay? Um, so this is what a typical um, liquid-only sewer um, looks like. You've got a home here, all the wastewater comes into the tank, just like with a normal septic tank, but there's a pump in there that moves the liquid out, and here you see that it can rely on gravity as well to flow it down to the uh, adjacent town, to flow the liquid down to the adjacent town. Um, this is a, a diagram from Orenco Systems, which is based in, um, in Oregon, but they've got a big presence in the southern part of the state. In Mobile and Baldwin counties, uh, they've installed a lot of systems, I think 3,000, 3,500 uh, systems. Okay, so each, each home has that septic tank, the solids come into the tank, the liquids flow out, um, the effluent is conveyed to treatment, okay? For these systems, like I said, there's no minimum velocity. You don't need to worry about the wastewater stopping in, uh, in the pipe. And it's typically just a two to three inch or even a, or maybe a four inch pipe to, to convey the liquids. Um, much less expensive per mile. So the estimates that we've seen are about $35,000 to $50,000 per mile to run the pipe. But every home has this tank with a pump it's got to have electricity hooked up. It's got to be plumbed. So it's about $10,000 a home to install the tank, okay? So depending on the number of homes you have, it can be, and, and the distance that you need to convey um, the liquid, it can be the most efficient uh, solution. 
And just to show you in terms of the installation, why it's so much less expensive, you can install the pipe just based on either trenching, say two to three feet down. We don't need to worry about freeze thaw in Alabama, which is a big advantage uh, for these types of systems. And you can see that uh, pipe there, that's an insulated pipe for an area with, with potential freeze thaw. We don't need to, uh, that's really not um, a major concern for us. You can also run it by directional boring, um, uh, run the pipe by directional boring under, um, under curbs, et cetera. Okay, so we have a system uh, that's um, in installation right now. The treatment unit has been installed. It's gonna be a, a four phase um, uh, installation, but it's going in in New Bern in Hale County. So about an hour south, maybe an hour and five minutes drive south of here. Um, phase one, uh, the phase one treatment unit has gone in. It's a modular system. So more treatment units can be added as the flow uh, increases. We did try to do um, not crop irrigation. I mean, if you count trees as a crop, but we were trying to do pine forest irrigation with the effluent, but um, the groundwater table was too high, so we couldn't get the permit. So we're going to do a tr traditional MPDES permit to discharge to Big Prairie Creek. Um, we hope the crop, that the irrigation of the silviculture, the Lobolly pine, will work uh, at some point. Um, it does benefit the trees in terms of their growth rate uh, and their mass accumulation to... Uh, to have nutrient-rich wastewater uh, as your, uh, for irrigation. So um, that project is underway. Um, the, um, all the electrical work and the plumbing should be done next week, and the unit should go online um, for the Auburn-owned properties shortly, and then uh, to be expanded um, more broadly. There is another um, option here that incorporates liquid-only sewer but connects to an existing gravity sewer, and that would be a combination of, of type 1 and type, type 3 uh, of these systems. That is an option. However, we found that many of the existing wastewater utilities, they don't really have a lot of capacity as it is in terms of operational capacity. Many of them are right up against or above uh, their permitted uh, flow, daily flow. So um, it's been challenging to find places where this is a good fit, but I think it's a really, it really makes a lot of sense where you can uh, piggyback on the existing operator um, and the capacity that the utility has. Um, in terms of financing and management, that was the biggest problem when we first started. It was really hard to find the money uh, to install these systems. However, the federal government did come up, did uh, establish two large infrastructure-oriented um, uh, funding sources, the American Rescue Plan Act um, in uh, 2022 and uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, same year. So, the state legislature uh, voted um, to all on the allocation of those funds, and we received some of those funds to put in that system in, uh, in Newburn. We got $2.8 million uh, for that. And then uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, that those funds are allocated annually, and there may still be some funds available. However, most of that's going to water issues, especially lead pipe replacement and, um, and, and PFAS, or emerging contaminant uh, issues. So uh, those funds are, basically all those funds are going to need to be um, spent by the end of 2026. So it, when, on the timeline of infrastructure projects, time is uh, getting short for those. Okay, so we thought this would be an ideal solution, and um, you know, many people really thought that a substantial proportion or maybe even a majority of low-income communities that were, having, that were struggling with wastewater issues could have them addressed through the ARPA and the BIL, but we've seen they've run into a lot of problems accessing these funds. Um, there's also written into the, these, is a preference for disadvantaged communities. There's something called Justice 40. Uh, there's um, regulations that like 50 or 51% of a certain pot of money has to be spent on low-income communities. Uh, but a lot of these funding mechanisms are really oriented towards large municipalities that have capacity um, with engineering, accounting, and other professional staff to process these grants or loans, to get them, um, to get them allocated, to, to put the job out to bid, et cetera. Um, most of these small communities in the Black Belt that are struggling with wastewater issues, they don't even have, um, you know, they might have a mayor, but a mayor who's not even um, really paid, I mean, maybe paid a, a nominal amount, not let alone a full-time mayor, let alone having a large uh, professional staff. Uh, large projects that serve thousands of homes generally have more, more bang for the buck in terms of the number of people who are being helped. Um, uh, but it's often, it's not usually taking what was raw sewage running onto the ground and, and, and putting it into a permitted system. 
Um, conventional tech, so the, the amount of help that's being provided to each individual is generally greater in these, uh, these low-income communities. And then for conventional technologies, there's a generally a bias towards funding things that people already are aware of. Um, and the firms generally want to do the things that they've done before, you know, mostly gravity, sewer, activated sludge, uh, things like that. Trying to get a firm that's never done it to do a liquid-only system, for example, is really, really challenging. You know, they don't have generally the staff with the experience to do that. Although there are some firms that are, that are interested in that sort of work. Okay, in terms of operations and maintenance, federal funds typically will subsidize the capital costs, but the clean water, written into the Clean Water Act is um, clear language that you can't fund ongoing operations and maintenance with Clean Water Act funds. So that's been uh, a barrier. Uh, you can establish a management entity, you can get things started, but it's not meant to be ongoing subsidy, okay? Um, in wealthy areas, um, O and M can generally just be integrated into um, into monthly sewer bills. Um, for low income areas, we need to really keep the bills uh, low. There's a lot of resistance to even say like a twenty or twenty five dollar a month bill uh, for sewer, uh, especially when people have been discharging their wastewater for free, whether legally or not. Um, in general, if you can partner with an existing management entity that already has operators who are certified, um, already has that infrastructure and staffing in place, it can be a big advantage in, in terms of keeping the, um, the cost low. Also, we need to find a certified operator or operators who live in the area. Um, it's not finalized, but there, there's the potential for a regulation that the operator has to live within 50 miles of the system. Um, that would be um, probably cause a challenge in the Black Belt where we're hoping to have a kind of a circuit rider model where a lot of small systems can be operated by uh, one or two individuals. Um, yeah, like I was I mentioned remote monitoring and management, that's a big um, advantage of, uh, of these systems that enables decentralized management of, uh, of this infrastructure. And then um, workforce issues, uh, generally in water and wastewater, we're losing a lot of people from the field. Um, trying to replace them uh, is a big challenge. We're trying to do education and outreach and workforce development through some of our projects that I'll talk about uh, shortly. For option two, the on-site systems, we found something that was a surprise for us that we didn't expect to be such a challenge, and that is air property, where the property doesn't have clear title. And it's very challenging legally to work on a property if you don't have the permission of every owner of the property. So um, it's actually technically impossible. Nobody really um, wants to do it. Uh, our partner, the Black Belt Unincorporated Wastewater Program, really, I would say, spent probably more time trying to clear title for properties than they did actually installing systems in the first couple of years of operation. Um, however, uh, there are records, they're not public, but there are records of how many owners a property has. And one of our partners in rural sociology at, at Auburn has that database. So prioritizing the homes that do have clear ownership allows you to get started on those while you work on title on the others. And we found that that has kind of greased the wheels to get systems installed. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, multiple homes on a single property. That's, these are often air property as well. But when you have um, multiple homes on a single property, typically we'll have one water meter that goes to the main home, say um, a home on slab, and then say you've got three trailers that have been rolled onto the home over the years where relatives live, maybe maybe kids, nieces, nephews, or whatever. Um, those, uh, those situations can be le legally challenging, but in terms of the bang for the buck that you can get, you can potentially cover, say, four homes with a single system, um, if it's, or, or, or even two systems. Uh, so the cost per home can, can decline quite a bit if, you can, uh, if, you're, if you're able to work uh, in those settings. So in terms of... Uh, these issues, we've talked to some lawyers and are looking for legal help with legal approaches to those. If anyone has any suggestions and has seen any approaches that have worked to, um, to facilitate getting work done on homes without clear property, with, without clear uh, a title, um, et cetera, please reach out. I, we'd love to hear them. Um, we established a consortium for Alabama Rural Water and Wastewater Management. I mentioned that before. These images are, are not uh, comprehensive, but this is an example of some of the um, organizations. A lot of uh, public universities, uh, ADPH and ADEM, the two main um, state agencies that are involved, the governor's office. Uh, Congresswoman Terry Sewell has been a long time been a champion of this. She sends her staff uh, to these meetings. Uh, Senator Katie Britt, uh, Senator Shelby was, was deeply involved in that uh, as well when he was still working. Now Senator Katie Britt has, uh, has gotten involved. Um, 
the Alabama Rural Water Association, Alabama Rivers Alliance, um, some Lixil, which is the parent company of American Standard. They've done free installation of low flow fixtures uh, for some of these um, uh, projects. Uh, in terms of the current projects we've got going through the consortium, uh, the Black Belt Unincorporated Wastewater Program is installing on-site wastewater treatment systems in Lowndes County. There's money now available for them to expand beyond Lowndes County. Uh, that was um, American Rescue Plan Act uh, funding. Uh, we got a US EPA grant. Um, we titled Reinventing uh, Rural Wastewater Management, uh, looking at cost-effective alternatives and developing a how-to guide for rural communities. How do you get started finding the appropriate solution for uh, your community? Um, these uh, lists of activities are not comprehensive. There are many partners on these and working on a lot of stuff, but just trying to give you an overview. We got funding from Columbia World Projects uh, to collaborate with people at Columbia University, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, and others uh, to look at this problem, establish uh, this, uh, this system in New Bern, and, um, and test, get baseline testing to see what the, um, the positive effects were of installing uh, that system in New Bern. Um, we got USDA Rural Development funding um, to do wastewater needs assessments across the entire Black Belt, uh, developing community-specific management tools, testing treatment technologies, monitoring water quality, et cetera. Um, International Paper Foundation invested in piloting cost-effective systems when there's multiple homes on a single property. Um, and uh, the Richard Lounsbury Foundation uh, gave some money for monitoring baseline water quality and doing K-12 outreach and getting started with workforce development. And we just found out last week we got more money from, uh, from the USDA to pilot a market-based um, approach to on-site system installation and management uh, for the design life of the system. So I talked to some vendors and they said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'd be interested in, in bidding on this uh, project. So that money should come through this spring and hopefully by the end of uh, 2024, we'll have systems being installed and actively managed by um, wastewater companies that have experience in the business. So not a long-term subsidy program, but a market-based program to where these companies uh, get established with some grant money and then hopefully develop a sustainable uh, business. Um, there's a lot of acknowledgments here. This isn't comprehensive either, but so many people have helped. I don't want to make it seem like this is just something that's happened at the University of Alabama, let alone just uh, through my group. But um, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the partners, I'll probably, I probably need to provide an updated list of all the people who've worked at these different organizations as well. But um, that's it for now. Hopefully there's some time for questions. Uh, thanks everybody for your attention.